Everyone is talking about semiconductors right now. But here's the truth. Very few people actually understand how the semiconductor industry works, how chips are designed, where the bottlenecks are, and most importantly, which Indian companies are positioned to benefit as India builds its semiconductor ecosystem. So in today's video, we're going to simplify everything. Why semiconductors matter so much, why the world desperately needs new chip manufacturing hubs, what India is doing with its 76,000 crore semiconductor mission, which Indian companies stand to benefit short term and long term, and how investors should approach this opportunity realistically. Let's begin. Semiconductors are basically the brain inside any electronic device. For example, a modern car has 1200 to 1500 chips. And as we move into AI, self-driving cars, 5G, 6G, smart defense, smart cities and Internet of Things appliances, chip demand is going to explode. But right now, one small country, Taiwan, controls the world. If Taiwan stops, the world stops. This is why the US is pushing Intel and TSMC to open fabs, China is investing billions, Japan is reopening chip fabs and India has entered the game, hopefully at the right time. India launched a semiconductor mission or the ISM with the incentive package of 76,000 crores. The goal is to build chip fabs, OSAT or ATMP units which are basically assembly and packaging, chip design ecosystems and a trained semiconductor workforce. But chip manufacturing is not like starting a steel plant or a new battery factory. Building a semiconductor chip is a complex process. Think of it as constructing a highly intricate city. There are multiple steps to building the city, from planning to execution to materials. The first step is designing the blueprint or the city planning. Just as city planners create detailed maps and layouts for the city, engineers design the circuit architecture and layout of the chip, determining where every component will go. This is at the cutting edge of technology, with engineers trying to make chips as small as possible. The smaller the chip, the more powerful the system can be because we can fit in more chips. Simple as that. Simply remember, as the chips get smaller, complexity increases. Now the second step is creating the silicon wafer, which is like clearing the land on which a city is to be built. The pure silicon crystal acts like the land or the foundation of the city. It's sliced into thin wafers which serve as the base for building the chip, buildings, bridges, whatever is needed. Next step is photolithography or mapping of the city. Using a process similar to aerial photography and mapping, Patterns are projected onto the silicon wafer. Light-sensitive chemicals are applied and light exposes specific areas, defining where circuits will be formed, basically creating a map before building the chip. The next step is etching and doping, which is actually building the streets or the infrastructure of a city. The exposed areas are etched away, creating trenches and pathways akin to digging roads. Doping introduces impurities into the silicon, creating areas of conductivity. This is like adding specific materials to modify the land for design purposes. For example, to build a large park, we might want to add red soil to a piece of land. Similarly, to increase conductivity in certain areas of the chip, we add specific types of impurities. Then we have layering and repeating. Multiple layers of circuitry are built up, like constructing a multi-story building. Each layer adds complexity and functionality. Each layer is built by repeating the previous two steps. Then we have metallization or installing power lines and wiring in a city. Metal layers are deposited to connect different parts of the circuit, similar to installing power lines and roads connecting neighborhoods. So we created a design, then we made sure that the land was fit for construction, then we made changes as needed for specific buildings, and finally added layer upon layer of construction. That's how we build a city, that's how we design a chip. Then comes testing and inspection, which is like city inspection. The completed chip undergoes testing to ensure all circuits work correctly. Analog is to city inspections verifying infrastructure safety and functionality. Finally, we have dicing and packaging, in which the wafer is cut into individual chips, then packaged for protection and connection to other systems. There is no analog to this in city building, but I think you understand. Now, in the semiconductor industry, the designing, which was step one, and the mapping are the most technologically difficult parts. This is again because the size of some of the mapping is several times smaller than a grain of sand. India currently does not possess the ability to work at the front lines of this technology. We can, however, execute every other step, and they are collectively called OSAT or OSAT, Outsourced Semiconductor Assembly and Testing. Remember this, it comes up again. Coming back to the complexity of building a semiconductor industry, a semiconductor fab costs anywhere between 5 to 15 billion dollars. It requires 99.9999999% clean rooms, needs ultra pure water and uninterrupted power. It also takes 4 to 7 years to stabilize yield. So even for the simplest part of building a high-end chip, India's strategy has to be long term and step by step. 
Phase 1, which is happening right now, is to focus on OSAT or Outsource Semiconductor Assembly and Training, which we just discussed. Phase 2, which would be 3 to 5 years from now, will be to start producing low-end chips. These chips are 28 to 65 nanometers in size and the mapping here is comparatively easier. Finally, we have Phase 3, which would be 6 to 12 years from now. And then you will see us move to advanced nodes, which are sub-14 nanometer chips. This is minimum a 10 to 15 year national project. It's not a short term hype and we as investors would do well to remember that. With that understanding, let us discuss the major semiconductor projects in India and which Indian listed stocks benefit directly or indirectly. They include ones by Tata Group, Micron Tech from the US, a failed partnership between Vedanta and Foxconn and ISMC. Within the Tata Group, which is the clear leader, the listed stocks to watch are Tata Alexei, whose main advantage is in the EV segment. It builds MCUs or motor control units, which is basically the brain of an EV. It controls the flow of power between the battery and the motor, so no MCU, no motion. It also makes BMS or battery management systems along with software design solutions. Totata LXE might not be producing chips, but it is designing the chips to be used in an industry with great potential. An expected revenue breakdown for Tata LXE could look something like this. From 3600 crore this year to 5000 crores in two years as chip demand in automotives explode and over 10,000 crore by 2030 if India-based fabs do become a reality. The second stock is Tejas Networks, which acquired a company called Sankhya Labs, a company with expertise in semiconductor design. This was done to bolster its wireless product offerings. Sankhya Labs, on the other hand, has received government approval under the Semiconductor Design Linked Incentive or DLI scheme to develop a system on chip for 5G telecom infrastructure equipment. The company is also developing indigenous semiconductors for D2M technology, which is described as India's first fully Swadeshi deep tech platform. D2M or Direct to Mobile Technology is a broadcasting method that transmits content directly to mobile devices without needing an internet connection. It works similarly to FM radios, using terrestrial signals to deliver media, similar to how our TVs used to function a couple of decades back. These efforts are boosted by Indian government's semiconductor incentive schemes, which aim to boost indigenous chip design and manufacturing. An expected revenue breakdown for Tejas Networks could look something like this. 3,000 crores this year to over 7,000 crores as 5G infra rollout makes its way into private enterprises. By 2032, this revenue could reach 15,000 crores as silicon makes its way into silicon defence. Now, what is silicon defence? It refers to India's strategic push to build national defence and communication systems that run on Indian-controlled silicon, firmware, software and network standards. This minimizes reliance on foreign telecom vendors. Tejas Networks would be how all these chips in all the parts of our country communicate. Tata Power Semiconductor's operations involve its subsidiary called Tata Electronics, which is building India's first commercial semiconductor fabrication plant in partnership with Taiwan's Power Chip Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation or PSMC. It is also an indirect play on the power demand in this industry, since this industry is a glutton for power. Tata Power is the go-to supplier for all Tata projects, so that's a direct benefit to the company. We also have Dixon Technologies, which is India's largest manufacturing service company. As more chips are made and packaged locally, smartphone and consumer electronics production will rise. Dixon benefits from more localization, higher margins with scale and government PLI schemes. This is a strong manufacturing execution play. An expected revenue breakdown for Dixon Tech could look something like this. From 15,000 crores this year to 28,000 crores plus as they enter local semi-packaging and finally over 50,000 crores if India also starts designing high-end chips. We also have two small cap stocks called ASM Technologies and SPEL Semiconductor. These are pure play semiconductor back-end companies. They are involved in testing and assembly and packaging right now. SPL Semiconductor is India's only dedicated OSAT company, meaning they assemble, package and test chips after the wafers fabrication stage. We've already talked about this. Think of them as India's packaging and testing facility, similar on a much smaller scale to companies like the ASE Group in Taiwan, Amcor in USA and JCET in China. SPL Semiconductor is arguably the best pure play in chips because India does not yet have large wafer fabs, but packaging and testing is where India can scale fast, again as we talked about. SPL is India's foothold in homegrown packaging capacity. ASM Technologies, on the other hand, does not manufacture chips. Instead, they provide design support, testing automation, product engineering, packaging, R&D and manufacturing process solutions to other semiconductor companies. 
Its key strengths include partnerships with global semiconductor companies from the US, Japan, Taiwan, along with an engineering manpower advantage which helps reduce costs for major chip makers. They specialize in next-gen packaging as well. These are two small caps though, so high risk but potential high reward. Suitable only for a small allocation. Simply put, if India's semiconductor industry scales, these explode. If it delays, these crash. In the best case scenario, by 2030, their revenue could be anywhere between 8 to 15x from today. Next, we have Reliance Industries and it's a future wildcard. Reliance has already entered data centers, 5G, 6G, R&D and entered electronics manufacturing via Geophone. Mukesh Ambani openly said semiconductors are strategic to India's future. So if Reliance announces a fab or OSAT unit, it will be a game-changing moment similar to Geo entering telecom. This is a strategic watchlist stock, not a buy right now. We also have LNT and Bhel, which are infrastructure enablers. Chip fabs need hyper-precise clean rooms, stable power infrastructure and water, as I said, at an extreme purity. LNT has experience in precision industrial construction, where they already built clean rooms for pharma, aerospace, defense electronics, and ISRO labs. LNT is arguably the only Indian company capable of executing this at the scale that India is aiming for. Bail, on the other hand, supports the infrastructure and end use product side of semiconductors, not chip making directly. A single advanced fab uses anywhere between 240 to 450 megawatts of continuous power. That is equivalent to the power needed for a small city. As India builds fabs in Dholera, Sanand, Mysuru and Assam, Bhel will likely be a primary power infrastructure contractor. This is not small, we are talking about anywhere between 5,000 to 25,000 crores per fab. However, this is a long-term nation-scale theme. If we invest, we should keep these things in mind. We shouldn't chase penny stocks claiming semiconductor deals. We should stick to companies with proven execution, keep our exposure to 5-10% to of our portfolio and think at least 8-12 to 12 years ahead. This is like investing in Infosys in 1995, Maruti in 1986 or HDFC Bank in 1994. It might be slow at first, but it will get exponential later. So yes, India's semiconductor journey has started. We are late, but we're moving fast. Tata has taken the lead, Micron is operationalizing, government policy is aligned, private capital is coming in, global geopolitics is benefiting us. If India gets this right, we don't just become a manufacturing country, we become a technology superpower. Let me know in the comments, which company do you think will lead India's semiconductor revolution? Tata? Reliance? Someone new? I'll be reading and responding. Thank you.